Hello, I'm Susan Crumdike, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and you have found the Transition Engineering Podcast, where we talk about how to make the energy transition work. Hello, we are back. And we are here to talk more about the things that have led to the development of transition engineering as a new field, an emerging field. And um, today we are going to do something strange as far as engineering goes. I hope you don't mind, guys. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm here with, with Belen and with Philip again. Huh? And we are we are recording this in Munich. Um, and we've we're going to deal with something funny for engineers. And, and why I say that is because we're going to deal with emotions. All right. Nice. Right? <laughs> emotions. An emotional response. Dealing with your state of mind. Um, in our earlier podcasts, we hit the mega problems, the mega issues of climate change and fuel supply. Um, we've got a lot more of that to do too. Fuel scarcity, um, resource scarcity, water, population, there are a lot of problems, and I think uh, anybody listening to this podcast probably is aware of the problems. What do you do after you become aware of the problems? Here's, here's the thing. I've worked with a lot of groups, a lot of community groups, people who are concerned about climate change, about oil, about resources. And, and I, I like to ask them, well, what, uh, well, first, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> 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 but the, the next question is, um, okay, do you want to know more about those problems or, or what, what do you think you're going to do about it? Who's going to mm. do what? Well, our politicians, they, they really think that the politicians don't understand the yeah. problems. Right. I sort of think they do, but here's my question. Let's say that, that I could figure out the perfect way to communicate what the problems are to whoever your favorite politicians are, what would they do the next day? Prepare for the next, uh, <laughs> the next election. <laughs> they do what they've been doing, right? Yeah, right? Like they don't know what to do it about it any yeah. more than you do. Yeah. So, so this is one of those things we, we sort of talked about that in the, in the Titanic story that, mm. that everybody sort of has their own place in society and their own jobs that they're doing. And, and you might really want other people to be as worried about the problems as you are, um, and, and that's fine, but what can they actually do about it? So in this podcast here, we're going to talk to other engineers, and if you're not an engineer, that's fine. You probably know one. Um, tell them to listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but as engineers, we are going to look at our response to these problems that you you might not have actually known we had you probably knew we were on a finite planet yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's sad but <laughs> <laughs> we're on a finite planet we we've seen that one image that uh, the apollo astronauts took of the oh. earth looking back at it yeah and and Beautiful. we know now that's our little spot in the universe <laughs> and then We've got the things that to us seem so real and, and like it's been that way forever, but being able to get on an airplane and fly to Europe, keep being able to get in your car and drive to the mountains for the weekend to go skiing, all these things that we just normally do now that when we look at, at the trajectory of growth, and resource limits we start to see that we're on a boom and bust path here actually not a growth forever path mm -hmm. yeah. and how does that make you feel to know that we are really at a peak in so many things or past the peak and we are now on that downhill side and we don't exactly know what to do about it yeah, you're so used to doing things that you couldn't do uh, 100 years ago and I don't think you feel like you're in a peak I, it doesn't, doesn't look like doesn't it does it feel like <laughs> yeah because tomorrow you're gonna do the same thing you did today right. yeah. Yeah. and we talked about future blindness in in episode four yeah 
that huh. yeah, it really is hard to think about that in the future things are going to be different, right? Whether we want them to or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. We can do everything. <laughs> right. And that things in the future could be really bad if we don't do things right now that we don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we are in a tight spot. Right. We're in a tight spot. We're in a tight spot. And when you get some really bad news, the psychologists know all about this now. When you get some really bad news, like you get a bad diagnosis, your health is, is in danger. You know, you have a bad disease. Yeah. Someone you know has just been in an accident. These are, there's, there's times when we get really bad news that we can't actually fix right now. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So if we imagine that we've gotten that kind of bad news, um, oil supply is in a range now where it's peaking. And regardless of the media that you hear and the IEA and different things like this, it will decline. Mm. Um, the climate news is really bad. The Greenland ice sheet is melting like crazy. Yeah. It's, you know, this is really bad news. What, what do you do? What, what psychologically happens when you get really bad news? Yeah, you, you're shocked. <laughs> you're <first>. shocked? <laughs> yeah. Like what? Uh, you don't yeah. want to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shock. I can't even process this. I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. And disbelief. That can't be right. Right. Yeah. If it was that bad, then it would seem that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, I, but but everything's fine, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So, shock and disbelief—that is a very natural first reaction to really bad news. Mm. So, shock we understand. I think that that. Uh, do you guys remember when when did you first hear about um, climate change? This. Pooh, good question. Started at school. <laughs> right. And it's it's been so normalized now, Maybe really. School, we yeah. just say, oh, yeah, the climate change. And, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, emissions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so maybe climate change isn't as shocking for you anymore, except maybe when you when you hear uh, about a giant piece of Antarctica yeah. falling off and mm. floating away. Yeah. So maybe. there's these these micro shocks around <laughs> climate change. What about um, what about peak oil or the end of growth? When did you hear about when did you hear about those? But it's um, not that long ago, I believe. Okay. Do you remember being a bit shocked by that information? Uh, I mean, uh, what would that be like if we didn't have oil? So, yeah. You kind of not believe it, right? Right. Yeah. But that can't be right. I mean, yeah. I can go get my car filled up with fuel right now. Yeah, so the world is working so <laughs> and somebody will find something right mm. that can't be right it must be years away yeah right so you sort of get this this disbelief that jumps in right away right and part of that is due to our future blindness that it's an obvious thing that <laughs> using a finite resource it will run out yeah you will get to a peak and then it will decline that that's just mathematically correct um but then you start to push that information away. And that's mm. what we're calling the disbelief that, well, but that won't happen for years. Um, what's another one you hear from climate people all the time for climate deniers? Oh, well, the climate has always changed. <laughs> right. Oh, it's actually getting colder, not hotter. You get these denial. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And denial of global warming has become a whole industry now, I think. I mean, there's people, there's a lot of money in denying. Yeah. Yeah. In the media. Um, yeah. What do you mean with denying? Denial. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the Koch brothers are famous for funding things that look like science but are actually okay. confusion science. All right. Okay. Obfuscation, we call it. Okay. <laughs> and right. getting money by clicks and advertising. Yes, yes. Right. Click, click, clicking. And putting out stories that look legitimate, but mm -hmm. but they're really just meant to confuse, um, to feed into this disbelief. And if you think about it, people, everybody you know has either not heard the news at all, which is hard to believe, or 
they have heard it and have been through this this denial phase and when you are in that denial phase boy do you want to hear somebody who agrees with you <laughs> boy do you want to hear that, that oh yeah. it can't be that bad oh it's years away don't worry about it oh the scientists are just they don't know what they're talking about oh there's there's doubt there's there's uncertainty in the measurements yeah. boy do you want to hear that yeah. that's why there is clickbait for those for those people and there are a lot of people in our societies who are stuck in that disbelief and denial phase yeah, right. yeah? all right so don't be surprised that they're there yeah. mm-hmm. and that it's easy for them to stay there it's just like a classmate that yeah. says he didn't start learning as well <laughs> <laughs> you yeah if you have people who go along with your idea yeah. and your belief it is much easier to stay there <laughs> right so are you going to get over that disbelief how are you going to do it um because it uh it, it's really hard to get over it um you, you people don't want to change yeah even if you feel like okay i i i think i believe this i see the evidence um, it's really easy to be put off of thinking about it anymore because you think, well, nobody else believes it. People don't want to do anything about it. The politicians don't want to know, mm. right? Convincing yourself of other people's disbelief is also very powerful. Yep, it is. Oh, right. Mm. Um, what happens after you get over that shock, that disbelief? You get past the denial and say, look, no, 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 the science is clear. I'm an engineer. I can understand thermodynamics. I can understand heat transfer. We have a problem. Yeah. You're an engineer. We have a problem. What do you do next? Solution! Yeah, search for an alternative. <laughs> search for the solutions. Of course you yeah. do. That is our job. That's what we do. You have a problem. There right. must be a solution. There must be some engineering. Right. Well, when people get really bad news, like a cancer diagnosis or, or a family member has just died, something like that, the brain first does the denial, the shock, horror, denial, and then your, your, your psyche tries to bargain, tries to make a deal. Mm. And I don't know, have you ever seen this like in a, in a movie or something where, um, and you can imagine yourself doing it maybe, you appeal to the powers of the universe or to God, you know, just let me live through this and I promise <laughs> I won't get drunk anymore or I will I will take care of, of poor people in Africa. I'll do something good, right? Yeah. There's got to be a bargain I can make with the universe that this really bad thing, um, I can make it go away. I can, I can fix it. If only I can balance out that bad thing with some good thing. Yeah, right. So that's the bargaining. We we want right. we want that karmic balance of some sort. Mm-hmm. So for engineers, this is this is where so many of us uh, in the professions get get quite caught up in this one. Because look, okay, we get it. We can do the math. Fossil fuels are a problem. Using them is a problem. Part of the problem is that we we're stuck we're stuck with them we we've built around them they work really well (laughs) this is a problem so what's our bargain what can we do for you alternative fuels (laughs) right (laughs) biofuels wind energy marine energy alternatives yeah yeah that must be what we need to do must be the solution that must be the solution And have a lot of our engineering friends gone there? Yes, they have. Yes, they have. And I'll tell you what, little story from me, I did too. Um, one of my first jobs as an undergraduate was working in the Wind Technology Research Center okay. in the US. Oh. It's working on variable speed controls for wind turbines. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so excited. That's I wanted to work in renewable energy. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a really good project. You could see that it would it would um, it would take some work to get these wind turbines working. And I don't mind saying this was in the early '80s, um, <laughs> but they could get working, and then we could have wind power. And 
I was so excited about that. And I wanted to work in the wind, ener wind energy industry, mm -hmm. right? I want to be part of this. I want to be a researcher on it. Um, and then one day I sat down with a calculator. We had those back in the day. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I started calculating how much, how much energy these things made and how much we were actually using, how much electricity we were using. And I couldn't get it to add up. I could, uh, yeah, we could do this, but it doesn't, it, it, ha mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's not matching. Yeah. The substitution story isn't working. Mm -hmm. The wind turbines, I'm sure we can make them work. Right. But the substitution story isn't working. And I was having a hard time with that bargain. So yeah. I moved on to solar. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and then Next. sort of the same thing we yeah. can make solar hot water work we can make these coatings for windows we can understand shading we can we can do solar gain we can we can make solar photovoltaics cheaper if we could just get the materials figured out we could do all these things and yet solar energy reaches the earth at a rate that is not the same at all as the 400 years worth of solar energy stored in a barrel of oil. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. Oh dear. So while solar energy is great and, and I'm excited about it and, and it's a it's a great bargain, it, it's, it's not a substitute for the thing that we're doing that's wrong. So I'm having mm -hmm. a hard time there. And then I went on to biofuels and then hydrogen and, uh, and so on. Yeah, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> if I would just put away my calculator and stop looking at the, at the the actual numbers yeah, but, no, but that's, that's a... how i got to transition engineering right. was by looking at the actual numbers and being able to deal with the desire i had to bargain mm -hmm. you have to sure. actually i'm sorry but you have to get past the bargaining yeah right so and what's... i know that it's a very comfortable place for engineers <laughs> i spent years and years working to try and make hydrogen work <laughs> <laughs> and then i finally sat down with a calculator oh yeah, my gosh right. so what's we next? will talk about these some more because <laughs> so... bargaining man it isn't just about the alternative energy sources is it it's about these dreams of of the other things we could do so what do you think is one of our favorite bargaining chips yeah, the electric car. Oh probably. gosh, do we love the electric car? You're right, Philip. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Actually. Oh, how fun is it? This idea of the electric car. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid it might be one of those bargaining things, though. I know. Again, well, it, it has just like wind, solar. It, it has a role, but it's not the substitute that we're trying to bargain that it is. Right. So we will look into that some more as well. But yeah. just recognize that that green tech, mm. um, green things, the, the electric car, the autonomous car, this is us trying to deal with the stress right. of change of a type that we don't understand yeah. and that is hard to see. Right. Right. Um, carbon capture and storage is another one of my favorite bargaining mm. chips. Sounds so good. What if mm. we could just grab the carbon out of the air? Of course, that would be great. And oh my gosh, once you've looked at enough of these and done enough of these calculations and gone, but that's not going to be what people are saying it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. you turn and you look at your own field of engineering and you go, but we did this. Right, mm -hmm. the problems that I'm looking for these solutions to are good engineering. We got to this point of making this mess by doing good work. F feeling guilty now. Yes. Right. It was us. It was our people. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it wasn't really the, the politicians, and yeah, the economists. It wasn't really them either. It's it. It was us doing what we do really well, burning right. fuel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. So what about mm. what about the future? What about nature? What about what about our grandchildren? Mm. Okay. What I can tell you is that what people people know is that guilt is not very good for innovative thinking. <laughs> right. <For sure. laughs> It's really understandable mm. if we feel guilty about having built all those coal-fired power plants, about having built all those roads, airplanes, airports, 
and having gotten it so wrong on the scale of a century or, or, or generations of people that it was really good for a while, but, but now we have to change it all. And, and having that guilt about that is going to be quite natural. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, it doesn't help you solve problems, though. It doesn't help you think of new things. Mm. So you do have to get over it. And I don't know, do you, do you know anybody who's like that, who just loves to wallow in the guilt of all the things we've done wrong? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. There's always that kind of people. <laughs> and it can get stuck there. Yeah. And so can yeah. we. I do know some, some engineers who really are having a hard time getting over the fact that, that you know, we're complicit okay. in climate change. So stuck and, in the guilt. Yes. All right. So um, recognize that mm, that's mm. what that feeling is, and that's why you feel that way because it's natural to feel that way. But we're gonna sure. we're gonna need to move on. Okay. Now, according to the psychologists, once you move on from shock and disbelief and bargaining and um, and guilt, is that you get to anger. Okay. Right. It yeah. must be somebody's fault. <laughs> Why aren't people listening to the climate scientists? Mm -hmm. The oil companies are making all this money and they're making money on war and people won't change their selfish behavior and politicians are all corrupt. Okay, that, that felt good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? You're getting your relief from it. Righteous anger. anger. Yeah, right. Having a rant. Yeah. So go ahead and do it. <laughs> Have a rant. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I could just say the same. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's and always it's, the same. And you should be angry. Yeah. Everyone should be angry about things that aren't right. Right. Yeah. yeah. About things that are unfair. But that doesn't help you in any way. No, it doesn't doesn't make you more creative, really. Right. No, you need to <laughs> go one step forward. <laughs> That's right. So if we think about what the psychologists tell us about this, the stages of the way we think about this bad information, be careful because anger felt pretty good. You were right. There are people who are corrupt. There are things going wrong. But once you get past anger, yeah. be ready because the next stage is depression. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and depression isn't very good for creative thinking either. No, that's the worst. No wonder we want to stay in the bargaining stage and work on cool technologies. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> <laughs> going forward from there isn't comfortable. It's yeah. not nice. Right. And think about this. We've just talked about feeling feeling guilty about how good our our history of engineering has been, getting angry about about how it got this way without listening to scientists and people being greedy. Yeah. And then we're going to get depressed because it's too late. You know, there's been this huge screw up. It's all going to fail. I just don't want to think about it. Uh, <laughs> Shall we go down to the pub and have that conversation with some of your friends? <laughs> <laughs> Party stopper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to be your friend yeah. if you're going to do all this doomer stuff. <laughs> Doom and gloom. Yeah, right. <laughs> because in the, out of this depression, if you don't have hope, yeah. then then you, you give up. Yeah, right. Yeah. You're not going to take any action. Depression isn't helping either, no? Well, how do you deal with depression? You try to get away from it. Mm. You don't want to think about it. You want to just uh, have a beer and go party. And, <laughs> and, and <avoid> <laughs> them. <laughs> if it's all going to fall apart anyway, then I might as well go to Brazil right. and visit Brazil and see the, see the waterfall and see the monkeys <laughs> before they all go extinct. And... Mm -hmm. Before it can't fly. Yeah, yeah, let's party now. Right. Oh, I don't know if, if, if it ever feels like people are doing that. Maybe <laughs> yeah. they really do understand how bad the problems are. Yeah. Maybe that's their normal reaction to it. But again, we've got to get past that, yeah. that fatalism, that uh, giving up. Right. Right? That we've got to get past it. And I think that it is easier to get past it if you recognize it, mm. if you know, okay, it's normal to feel depressed about this. And um, it might be that you will go through this cycle of, of grief many times. Mm. Every, yeah. You know? Yeah. Could be that it's repeating, right? Well, every time you hear 
even worse yeah, news than yeah, what right. you thought you heard before. Your process stops and you fall back. Yep. And you... What? That can't be right. Mm. Okay, looks right. Well, we can do something about that. There are positive solutions, right? Right. Okay, on we go again. So just recognize that you can get through those stages and that you're going to get to depression and you need to be ready for that and move on. Because when you finally move on from that is when you can be comfortable that you do know the problem. If you've gotten guilty and angry and depressed, then you do understand that that was a bad problem. (laughs) Sure. Right? When not now. (laughs) When then, right? Yes. (laughs) So that's good because the first rule of engineering is that you have to define the problem. Yeah. You really have to understand the problem. Okay. And, you know, denying the problem isn't isn't helping. Working on things that aren't aren't actually going to work to solve that problem. That's that's not where we're at. Mm. So going through these stages of understanding, even if they're not comfortable, are important. And think about it. What if, as 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 people working in transition engineering, the actual work of that change. There are people that it is comfortable to go to the pub and talk about these things with. Mm. Self-help groups for engineers. (laughs) (laughs) It might actually be important that we can we can laugh about it because Mm. we know that we can get through it. Yeah. And then once we do really understand the problem, even though we know how bad it is, that's okay because that's where we need to be. So the psychologists call that final stage acceptance. That you've gotten past the anger, the guilt, and the depression. And you now accept the reality. That's cool. That's where you want to go. Well, how are we going to do real engineering if we don't accept the reality? And stuck in bargaining. (laughs) Exactly. So we are going to use everything we know about technology and science and math and all that good stuff but we are gonna accept the reality that we're actually working on. Mm. And they call it acceptance, accepting the reality and taking an appropriate action, taking actions that you actually can take that, that makes sense. That word was important, appropriate actions. Appropriate <laughs> actions, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so when you finally do understand the facts, the real facts, and I tell you what, we're in, a, we're in an era where that is getting tricky, isn't it? Mm. Which is, Again, um, I think if you're ever discussing these things with with other engineers and somebody brings up the word belief, Mm -hmm. the the word belief creeps into the discussion. But don't you believe in hydrogen? (laughs) I've had students ask me that before after I explained to them the facts of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. But don't you believe in hydrogen? And I said, ask me that again about the first law of thermo. (laughs) (laughs) there are things that are and they're based on knowledge they're based on measurable facts they're based on repeatable science Mm. and those do not require your belief yeah religion requires your belief yeah economics requires your belief (laughs) and substitution is also a key word that you should mention Right? There is no real substitution. Uh, not really. Right. Because that's that's the acceptance we have to get to is yeah. that we're talking about the decline of use of fossil fuels. Right. Yeah. Really. That yeah. is what we're talking about. Yeah. And that is the hard, hard job. Mm. Um, what we're even gonna call a wicked problem. Mm. Um right. <laughs> So understanding those challenges and the kind of changes that we're really talking about, which is reducing fossil fuel production, yeah. reducing fossil fuel consumption, and reducing the fossil fuel use by at least 6% a year overall, which means project by project really just downshifting right. the fossil fuel use in that yeah. um, system, in that um, application. Massive downshift. Yep. Um, and mm-hmm. while that might sound like something that sounds a bit impossible right now, have you worked on it? 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. How can you know what's possible if you haven't actually gotten to acceptance of the project in front of you and yeah. the action that you're going to take on working on that problem? Right. And that's sort of where we start transition engineering. Yeah. Yeah. It is going to be hard for you to do transition engineering projects if you are still stuck in the stages of grief. You need to get to the end. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if you need to have a beer with somebody and you're in Munich, yeah. <laughs> look up Philip. He can help you. <laughs> right. <laughs> he can help you get through the stages of grief and on to action. Right. Right. So um, just to wrap up here. Um, I think that one of the things that helps get through the, these, these psychological stages that you must get through and that you can get stuck in mm. any one of these stages, just understand that you, people you know, your professors, everybody can get stuck in one of these stages. Yeah. Um, the way that I've found most productive to get past it is naming the wicked problem. Now, you guys being in your 20s, are of the age that you will know who Harry Potter is, yes? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's part of your mythology, right? Part of your <laughs> part of your culture, Harry Potter. Yeah. And do you remember this really interesting bit of psychology that's in Harry Potter, which is about not naming he who must not be named? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, this is actually a thing that people do yeah. and have done for ages. You don't name the bad thing. Yeah. Right? You don't want to say Beelzebub's name because that lets <laughs> yeah. him in. Right. And so the author wrote that into Harry Potter that somehow acknowledging the existence of this mm. horribly evil character could call him upon you. Yeah. There's a risk in even naming the thing that's so bad and dangerous. Yeah. Well, it turns out that that's not actually true. That's a myth. Uh -huh. That there's power in naming it in giving it a shape and a size and and a definition mm. so we're going to say that defining our wicked problems is actually the cure to the stages of grief yeah. because it's such a huge part of acceptance and action mm -hmm. so what we mean by a wicked problem a wicked problem here we go think of it as a circle so we're gonna, it, it, you can't get out of it because it's a circle. Mm. It's not a linear thing, it's a circle. It, right. it, it's a snake that's eating its own tail, however you like to think of it, a circular, <laughs> circular issue. Um, a wicked problem is something that is great. It works really good. It's well-engineered, it does the job, it's profitable, it's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can it be a problem? Because it's not sustainable. <laughs> it's also dangerous. It's also uh, producing uh, climate impacts that aren't sustainable. It's a bad thing. Yeah, right. So it's a good thing. It's a bad thing. <laughs> Let's take uh, fossil fuels as an example. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Any use of, wick of, of fossil fuels is a wicked problem. All because right. how do we use fossil fuels that doesn't work? Yeah. They all work really good, right. right? I can fly from New Zealand to Europe <laughs> in a couple of days, <laughs> right? Yeah. Using fossil fuels works great, mm -hmm. but it is doomed. Right. It, it, it won't work. So. All right. Um, we, we make profit off it. it. It meets our needs, and yet it's putting us at risk. Right. So are, are, you, are you seeing that circle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that sort of trap, mm -hmm. um, sort of like a monkey trap. The thing we want most is also the thing that's got us trapped and puts yeah. us in danger. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that's our wicked problem. Okay. But let's name it. Let's, let's not be afraid of it. And mm -hmm. like you said, basically fossil fuels. <laughs> any, any use of fossil fuels okay. is a wicked problem. <laughs> that's all right. So. All right, so um, I think that's been an interesting journey this time, looking at course, uh, yes. our emotional response mm -hmm. and yeah. getting to, in fact, where engineers need to be. Yeah. Problem definition right. and putting it down on paper and not being afraid to name it. Getting Fair enough? Through. Fair enough. <laughs> All, right. All right, and we will talk to you next time about more of these crazy things. <laughs> See ya. See ya. Bye-bye.